was good to be here again. Uh, my wife hasn't been here in 45 years, so she's seen a lot of changes this morning. Uh, we, we were, we've been married 45 years, and married just right across the hall there. I remember kneeling at one point, and uh, everybody started laughing in the congregation. I didn't know why, but they had the shoe size written in chalk in real big letters. <laughs> so, anyway, so people were thinking more about my shoe size than anything else at that point. So anyway, our passage for this morning is 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10. If you have your Bibles, please open there. Uh, the subject of our uh, passage is receiving and resounding God's Word. Receiving and resounding God's Word. So let's read our passage, 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through 10, and then ask God's blessing on His Word. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the Word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, that is, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Well, let's ask God's blessing on His Word. Lord, we ask that You give us eyes to see this morning and ears to hear and a heart to understand Your Word and that we would leave transformed increasingly by Your Word this morning in order that we might reflect You increasingly, Your honor and glory. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> Little Beverly Smith, who was born in Akron, Ohio, almost never cried. She didn't cry when she fell down. She didn't cry when she burned her hand on the stove. She didn't cry when she bumped her head. And the doctors uh, finally diagnosed her uh, as having a defect in the central nervous system for which there was no known cure. And uh, the doctors told the parents they would have to watch her extremely carefully because if she fell down and broke her leg or somehow broke her arm. Uh, and of course, she wouldn't know it. And if it went on like that, then uh, it would be deformed. And so they'd have to be very, very carefully. Um, she, she did, however, cry when she was hungry. So, uh, or I should say angry. When she was angry, she would cry. Um, life without pain for her would be perpetually dangerous. And what would it be like for us as Christians if we never suffered physical pain or mental, emotional, even spiritual pain, social pain? Well, we're going to see in our passage this morning that suffering and pain indeed is part of a fallen world. And it's not accidental. It's not out of control. It's under God's hand in His plan. He has a purpose for it. And not just for individuals, but we're going to see He has a purpose for it for groups, for a whole church. And so we're going to see this morning that the main point of our text is at the end of verse 8. And if you look at the end of verse 8, notice what it says, so that we have no need to say anything. Well, if Paul had no need to say anything, I have no need to say anything, I think maybe we can stop and just have fellowship. I don't know. What do you think? Well, actually, I need to explain why Paul had no need to say anything. But it does sound at first like a weird main point, doesn't it? But it is the main point. And we're going to see it's full and not empty. Now, our passage this morning can be divided into three parts. Verse 1 is the lifestyle of the believing Thessalonians. And verses 7 to the middle of verse 8 is the first effect of that lifestyle. And then the end of verse 8, where he says, we have no need to say anything, from there on to the end of the passage in verse 10 is the second effect of the lifestyle of the believer from verse 6. Now notice how it begins in verse 6, you also became imitators of us. Now also, Paul has been thanking God 
He begins his thanksgivings and his letters always at the beginning, and so he does here. You'll notice verse 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. And he goes on and thanks them, for example, in verse 3, for their faith, their love, and their hope. And uh, so really, verse 6 is a continuation of that thanksgiving. And we're also, also thanking God that you became imitators of us and of the Lord. Now, uh, precisely how had they received the gospel? Uh, Paul is thanking uh, them uh, that they had received the gospel there in verse 6. Notice, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word. How precisely had they received it? Let's read again verse 6. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word, notice, in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of translations have of the Holy Spirit. It's really best translated as from the Holy Spirit. And that's going to be important as we're going to see. So they had received the gospel by imitating Jesus and the apostles' faith. And so our first main point from verse 6 is this, we're to follow Jesus and the apostles by being joyously faithful in God's word through trial. We're to follow Jesus and the apostles by being joyously faithful to God's word through trial. Now the first part of verse 6 says, notice the Thessalonians were imitators and you also became imitators of us. And how were they imitators? Well, uh, it says they received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did that in his life. He trusted in God. He trusted in God's word through uh, tribulation, often throughout his ministry. And that was climaxed by the cross where he continued to trust in God's word. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he quotes that not because he thinks God has forgotten him completely. He quotes it in the light of the whole psalm which shows a restoration of the person who is dying. He knows he's going to be restored. And so uh, the apostles, likewise, we're going to, going to see, were faithful to God's Word in the midst of suffering and joyously faithful. Very interesting. But how, how were the Thessalonians themselves suffering? We know how Paul was lashed and we know how Jesus uh, suffered throughout his ministry and at the cross. But how about the Thessalonians? Well, Acts 17 gives us a little historical background about how the Thessalonians suffered. So Acts 17, we're going to see. Chapter 17, verse 1. Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, chapter 17 of Acts, verse 2, he went to them and for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining, giving evidence that the Messiah, the Christ, had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah. He is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a great multitude of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar, coming upon the house of Jason, who was one of the prominent Christians, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. And when they did not find them, they be, that is, when they didn't find Paul, uh, they began dragging Jason out. And some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king, Jesus. And they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And they, when they received a pledge or a bond, he was, Jason was in jail. He had to pay money to get out. Uh, when they received a bond from Jason and the others, they released them. Now, Paul had gone on to Berea. And uh, we know that from the following verses. And when the Jews heard Paul went on to Berea, they followed him. Notice what verse 13 says. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea, also... They came there likewise agitating and stirring up the crowds. And despite that kind of pressure, the Thessalonians, Jason and the others, continued to trust in the Lord in the midst of that affliction. And our text says joyously. That's amazing. And we, we know from the second chapter the same thing. Chapter 2 and verse 13. 
of 1 Thessalonians says, and for this reason we also th constantly thank God that when you received from us the word of God's message, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what, what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. For you, brothers, became imitators. See, there, there it is again. Now imitators not of Jesus or the apostles, but of the churches in Judea. Notice, you became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They're not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles. Now, it's enough to suffer something. Probably all of us, to one degree or another, have suffered. But to suffer joyously, when you add that to the ingredient, it's very difficult. In fact, it's impossible to do with our own human resources. Only God, through the Holy Spirit, can give us that joy. That's what the text says. Look at it again in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word of much tribulation. Notice, with the joy from the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit that gives that joy. And this corresponds really well with uh, Philippians 1 and verse 29, which says, For to you it has been given, not only to believe, faith, that's, a, that's a, one of the texts that faith is a gift of God. It doesn't come from our own independent willing resources. It's a gift of God. For to you it has been given not only to believe, but to suffer for His sake. Now, as Reformed Christians, we think, oh, of course, faith is a gift of God. That's a common thing. Uh, and I'm sure here at Believer's Chapel, you have heard that uh, many times. But suffering as a gift of God, I don't think we usually think of suffering as a gift of God, but it is. That's amazing. So when we see our brothers and sisters suffering, we need to rally around them and pray for them that not only they persevere by faith, but do so joyfully. Recently, I had a friend who went through severe back pain, and it was very difficult. And uh, it, was, it was difficult uh, for her faith. And a number of us prayed for her, and, and, and she eventually came out of that. But it's, 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 I'm sure you've known people that uh, it's hard enough to have faith in those situations. Joyous faith? That's what Paul is talking about here. So we're to follow Jesus and the apostles in this. Paul says, for example, in Colossians uh, 1 24, I rejoice in my sufferings. 2 Corinthians 7 4, he says, I'm filled with comfort. I'm overflowing with joy in all our affliction. And so here also, the middle of verse 6, they receive the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. How did Paul have a joyous faith? How do we? Well, it's by God's grace. And we follow Jesus in that. He maintained joy in the midst of suffering, and he was motivated to have joy then because of the prospect of an even greater joy after the cross. Notice what Hebrews chapter 12 says. And verses 1 through 3 about this. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. See that? Joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him. Now we're to imitate him. For consider him, Hebrews 12, 3, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. Why do we consider Jesus? So that you, so that we may not grow weary and lose heart. Literally, that we would not faint in our souls. The opposite of that is to maintain our joyous faith, following <coughs> Jesus. It's difficult to conceive of what it means to have joy in the midst of pain or in the midst of suffering. Does it mean that we're just cheerful? We always have a smile on our face, um, you know, kind of maybe uh, giggling, laughing. I don't think that's the idea. I think the picture may be caught. We could think of a number of ways that can be caught, but one of them is the marathon runner. 
who at the end of the race, about 40 yards away, uh, the runner sees the finish line and looks back real quick and realizes everybody's too far behind me to, to catch me. And it's at that point, does he stop? Of course he doesn't. He, he tries to run even harder. But at that point, he has a lot of joy. Is he laughing? Is he cheerful? Well, of course not. I mean, he, he's at the height of his pain. But he has that, that deep disposition of joy that he's going to win. It's like that. It's a deep disposition of joy in the midst of suffering. And so uh, Jesus talks about this. He says in Matthew 5, verses 11 through 12, Blessed now, blessed now are you when people revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad now, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In 1 Peter 4, 13, Peter says, to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that at the revelation of Christ you may rejoice with exaltation. There'll be greater rejoicing. Someone has said that a Christian is like a tea bag, not much good until it has gone through hot water. Then it tastes a lot better. And our lives appear better. Actually, that's why God designed suffering in order that we would more resemble the image of Christ. Some people refer to that as a cruciform life, uh, being conformed to the sufferings of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, the conclusion of our epistle here says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. And certainly that includes suffering. It's tempting when we suffer, for example, physically to look horizontally. Why is this happening to me? Why, why, why is Joe Smith or um, Charlotte Jones, why are they so healthy? But really we need to continue to look up at such times. To God, His Word from which comes faith and joy. Some Christians believe that if we have enough faith, God will prosper us materially and physically. And that if you don't have enough faith, well, that's why you are either suffering physically or financially. Uh, some, some refer to that as the health and wealth gospel. Um, Paul does not uh, say that. We're going to see he contradicts that sort of thing. Now, by the way, I believe in a health and wealth gospel. There's nothing greater than a full, physical, healthy resurrection body at the end of time. If we persevere, God is going to bless us materially. But to think it's going to happen now is what I call over-realized eschatology. You're over-realizing what's going to happen at the end, thinking it should happen now. And so Paul says, in this regard, showing how normative suffering is for, uh, su uh, uh, that suffering is for uh, Christians, he says, notice chapter 3 and verse 2. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. And then chapter 3 and verse 3. So that no man may be disturbed by these afflictions, for you yourselves know we have been destined for this. Paul, the Thessalonians, all Christians are <coughs> destined for suffering. He says, verse 4, For indeed when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass as you know. And that it is normative is even clearer in Acts 14 and verse 22, where uh, we find the statement, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Now some of us may suffer more or less uh, at, at different times, um, but all of us will suffer in some significant way at one point or other in our life. And again, that's what Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing, why, why do we have to run with endurance? Because it's tough. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, 
who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So we're to endure like Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. Why? So that you may not grow weary and lose heart so that you may not faint in your soul so that you maintain your joyous faith in the midst of that suffering. So the first point of our passage this morning in verse 6 is that we're to follow Jesus and the apostles by being joyously faithful to God's word through suffering. That's the main point. But now we have to ask a very big question, and that is why? Why does God want us to be joyously faithful in trials? Well, we've begun to answer that question to some degree. We know it's God's plan. And we should take pleasure in that plan. But furthermore, we've seen, as with Jesus, that uh, if we are joyously faithful now and endure, as Hebrews 12 said, we'll receive an even greater reward and fuller joy in eternity. But God has another purpose beyond that. And that's what our passage is focusing on. Uh, and, and that is... Uh, he has designed uh, that we have joy and faith through trials. What happens when we're not begrudgingly faithful, but actually joyously faithful, taking a deep-seated pleasure in afflictions? Sounds masochistic. Verse 7 through the middle of verse 8 tells us the first effect of joyous faithfulness to God's Word in trials. What is that effect? Let's read verse 7 through the middle of verse 8. Verse 7, So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth. Well, what is this effect? What's this first effect? Well, when we maintain joyous faith to God's word in affliction, we become models of faith for others. We become models of faith for others. We saw in Acts 17 and elsewhere the Thessalonian Christians had believed in Christ despite persecution. Our passage this morning has told us as they continued to do that, they influenced others in their region to believe in Christ despite whatever suffering or persecution would come. So God's purpose is that our joyous faith in His Word through suffering is to be a witness to others of how to receive the gospel and how to continue to live as a Christian. People in the surrounding towns had seen not only their faith, but their joyous faith in the midst of suffering. And they were affected by it, as we have read. And they continued to witness. Not only was it a lifestyle witness of um, being joyously faithful uh, through affliction, but they witnessed by word. Look at verse 8. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth. And notice verse 7 is the example of the life. And is it by accident that then they speak the word in verse 8? I don't think it is. We're going to find that's a pattern elsewhere in Scripture, that the word spoken is especially effective when the life of godliness first is there. Notice again what verse 8 says, the word of the Lord sounded forth. Now notice it says in verse 7, they became an example. Now in Greek, this refers not to just being an example as we think of it in English, but a pattern which influences. In fact, the word for example here in Greek is tupos. It's the word type where we get typology from. And it actually could be translated a mold here. It sounds awkward, but so that you became a mold. What does that mean? Uh, well, you think of a mold. Um, you get these little uh, tin molds that are in a star at Christmas time. You get the pan with the dough, and you stamp the dough, put it in the oven, and out come star cookies. The little tin star mold is not there for itself. You don't hang it on the wall as a decoration. It's not very good looking. Uh, now, my wife does have uh, a, an antique wood mold that she does hang on the wall, and it's just there for itself. It's to do nothing else. 
But typical molds, like the 10 star mold, has a goal beyond itself. It's not there just for itself. It's to produce something beyond itself, the star cookies. You and I, in our Christian lives, as we trust in God's Word, faithfully, even joyfully, through affliction, we are molds. And molding some with a molding influence to, to trust in Christ, to receive the Word initially, and to continue to live as Christians by faithfully and joyfully trusting in God's Word. That's the essence, not only of evangelism. We're not here for ourselves. We're not here for our spiritual health. We're not here for our emotional happiness. We are here for something beyond ourselves. Yes, we need to maintain our spiritual health, closest to the Lord, faith and joy in the Lord. But it is for something beyond ourselves that we would have a molding influence on others, that they would come to trust in Christ and that they would live their Christian lives by trust and joy in God's Word. That's the essence of discipleship. No matter who you are, you may be a new Christian. You may not be an elder or a deacon. Every Christian is to have a molding influence. Think about that. Remember the Thessalonians were first to have a life example, verse 7, and then the word is spoken and is especially effective. When Paul and others reacted to suffering with joy and faith, it had the purpose of being a witness to others. For example, in chapter 5 of the book of Acts, we find the apostles were arrested for continuing to speak to spread the gospel. And beginning in chapter 5 and verse 40, it says that the Jewish leaders, after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them to speak no more in the name of Jesus and then released him. And then in chapter 5, verse 41, so the apostles went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they'd been considered worthy to suffer for his name. And remember when they're asked not to speak uh, about uh, Jesus, remember in verse 29, Peter and the apostles answered and said, must we obey God rather than men? No, they're going to trust in God's word. So they rejoiced, isn't that interesting, in the midst of their suffering, that they've been considered worthy to suffer for his name. And then notice what happens. They speak the word. Notice verse 42, every day in the temple and from house to house, they keep on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So you got the life, suffering, even joyous faith. Then they preach the word. Then what happens? Effective witness. Look at the beginning of chapter 6 and verse 1. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, the, the, you don't want to pass that by. They were increasing in number because of that example of joyous faith and then the preaching of the word. Paul was driven to endure trials joyfully because he knew that God used a joyous faith in God's word through affliction to bring others to faith. So the first effect of having joyous faith in the word through affliction, is that we become a, a model for others. We become a model for others. Verses uh, 8, the end of verse 8, all the way through 10, gives us a second effect of receiving the word joyfully, by faith, through trial. What is that second effect? Let's read it. Remember, the end of verse 8, which is our main point, so that we have no need to say anything. That's the second effect. Verse 9, for they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Well, what is the second effect? Well, it's when we maintain joyous faith uh, in God's Word through trial, we relieve the load of evangelizing from the, ch the shoulders of the church leaders. Let me say that again. When we maintain faith, joyous faith in God's Word through affliction, we, what's the effect? We relieve the load of evangelizing from off the shoulders of church leaders. The Thessalonian Christians were such effective examples 
in their lifestyle witness, verse 6 and 7, and in their verbal witness. They were so effective throughout the region, uh, th they witnessed so much by life and word, they drove Paul and his colleagues out of a job. They were going to go evangelize. Notice it says in verse 7, in Macedonia and Achaia. It's repeated in verse 8, and then it says, in every place your faith toward God has gone forth. So this is why Paul, the main point is, I have no need to say anything. Because the Thessalonians said it all. They became such amazing witnesses in life and in word. And they went out. Paul didn't have to. He had no need to say anything. What an amazing main point. What was it about the Thessalonians that others had heard about? Well, they not only had heard about their enduring faith, it was joyous and uh, in God's Word through trials. But they were very aware of what it was precisely that they were explaining as the gospel. What had they initially believed? Well, notice, we're told that in verse 9. For they themselves report about us. What a kind of a reception we had with you. Those in the outer regions, Macedonia, Achaia, in the outer regions were reporting how the Thessalonians had received Paul's gospel. Notice, what was it? Look at the middle of verse 9. How you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for a son from heaven. There it is. That's just like what Paul has said in verse 3 where he thanks God for their faith, love, and hope. Faith is the beginning of the Christian life. Uh, love is what endures throughout hope. We look toward the final conclusion of the Christian life with Christ coming. Here we have it in a different form. Number one, this is a formula for the Christian life. How you turn to God from idols. All of us have idols, by the way, if we're not Christians. And even as Christians, we're not completely finished with our idols. That's part of what sanctification is, getting rid of our idols. You turn to God from idols... Number two, to serve a living and true God. That's what we do throughout our Christian life. And finally, ten, thirdly, to wait for His Son from heaven. To wait for His Son from heaven. And what about that Son from heaven? Look at verse 10. Whom He raised from the dead. That is Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. There is the gospel. The Thessalonians are not going to have to suffer the wrath at the end of time. That wrath in which God will judge unbelievers and send them into the outer darkness and uh, uh, cause them to be separate from Him forever. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 says, They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. That's what's going to happen. That's the wrath of God at the end. Christians don't have to suffer that wrath. This is the gospel. The wrath of God, which was to take place at the end, which it will take place, for you and me, for those who've trusted in Christ, has been pushed back to the cross. Now that's what we call inaugurated eschatology. Or we could say it this way. The final wrath has been pushed back to the cross. And Christ died for you and me there. He died for those who would believe in Him. And why would they believe in Him? Because He died for His people. He died for those who were elect. And is elect out of mind here? Look at chapter 1 and verse 4. Knowing, brothers beloved by God, His choice of you, His election of you. You were elected to be in Christ not to suffer wrath at the end. Because Christ would suffer it for you. And notice what it says. Not only will uh, believers be delivered from the wrath of God, but notice Jesus was raised from the dead. That's the other part of the gospel. Not only does He suffer wrath, He overcomes it. He's raised from the dead. And then He sits at the right hand of God. And so um, all the believers, not just church leaders, in churches should have a lifestyle and verbal witness, in that, in that order, like the Thessalonians. The witness of the church is not merely the witness of a pastor or the elders or the deacons. It's not merely the witness of church leaders. It should be the witness of a church altogether, a corporate church. 
not only in word, but lifestyle. This is the way it ought to be. The leaders of a church cannot be the only ones evangelizing. To be really effective, it takes a lot of people to affect a region, as here. That's why the region was affected. A whole church did this. They went out and talked about how they trusted the Lord in His Word through suffering. They trusted in the gospel. Um, and so uh, when we receive and trust in God's Word, despite whatever suffering comes, it makes an amazing impact on people around. Because that's a supernatural thing, to have joyous faith in affliction. And when it's a group, that's why it made the impact that it did. It was amazing. In fact, you can think of uh, the book of Hebrews again and what some of the believers went through there. In chapter 10, we find in verse 32, uh, the author of Hebrews says, But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, partly by, coming, by becoming sharers with those who were so treated, for you showed sympathy to the prisoners and, now notice, accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession, a better property, an abiding one, that is, in the new heavens and the new earth. I don't know about you, but, uh, uh, well, I can say I would not be happy if the government came along uh, and said, we want your house now. You have no choice. Get out. I wouldn't be too happy. They were joyous. That's supernatural. That is supernatural. It can only be a gift of God. And of course, an end of, a group is a bunch of individuals. Individual witness is absolutely crucial. I remember there was a typist when there used to be typists. And uh, back in the 70s, and uh, this woman was part of a typing pool in a company. And uh, all the typists were sort of in the middle. Executives would come, give them what they needed typed up. And a new executive was hired. This was in London. And uh, he noticed that one of the typists was unusually industrious and very responsible, very careful. He noticed this over a period of time. And so he asked uh, one of the executives who had been there for a while. He said, why is Julie so industrious, so hardworking, so responsible? She stands out among the others. And, and the, old, the executive who had been there for a while said, well, Julie's a Christian. That didn't mean much to him. But the new executive kept watching her. Finally, he asked her, he said, why are you so careful, so industrious in your work? She said, well, I'm a Christian. And she went on to witness to him. He became a believer. You got the lifestyle, then the word. And then a, a, a little time later, he was giving his testimony in a church in Scotland. And in the audience was someone by the name of Sinclair Ferguson, who for the first time trusted in Christ through that testimony. And Sinclair Ferguson has become a well-known Reformed theologian, a writer. He's a professor. He teaches part-time at Reformed Theological Seminary here. Just think how her word affected, I'm going to speak figuratively, affected Macedonia and Achaia and the outer regions. Unbelievable. But imagine as a group if we were like that. God can bring suffering on many in a church, many, in order that the church have a corporate or overall group witness, which the whole Thessalonian church had for the entire region. And when a time of persecution comes here in the United States, because it, it, it comes in other areas of the world, churches do have a chance corporately, as they all suffer persecution, to have this kind of response. And so, um, lifestyle first, then the word comes. When there's joyous faith in trial by an entire group of Christians, the gospel message rings out. Notice how it rings out. Look at uh, verse 8. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth. Some translations have, it has trumpeted forth from you. Because it's an amazing thing to see Christians persevering faithfully and joyously in trial. It's an amazing thing. And so the word trumpets forth about that. The word here in Greek uh, is closely related to a word that's pronounced ekeo. Ekeo. 
My wife hates it when I pronounce Greek words and when, when I preach or teach. But echeo is where we get the word echo, okay? And the word has the idea of referring to a loud, resounding noise, whether of ocean waves or rolling thunder or of a gong uh, sounding. And so the point here is the good news announced by the Thessalonians was like a loud noise which seemed to reverberate throughout the hills and the valleys of the surrounding region. And so, what's the answer to our initial question about the purpose of suffering? Well, there's no doubt that God uses suffering to discipline us. We know that. Uh, the book of Hebrews uh, talks about that. Other passages talk about it, that, just as uh, children need to be disciplined uh, by their parents, so we need to be disciplined by the Lord. But that is not what our passage is saying about suffering. In this passage, it's not about discipline. Uh, what is it? Well, it's we become, and here's the main point of the passage, we become effective models and witnesses uh, when we maintain joyous faith in God's Word in affliction. We become effective models and witnesses when we maintain joyous faith in God's Word through affliction. Now some, as I've said a little earlier, might think that it's a form of self-torture or masochism to be joyous in the midst of painful trials. Well, I think there, there are a number of problems with that view, but one of them is that it expresses a wrong view of joy. One commentator has said this, if God told you that He was about to make you as happy as you could be in this world, and then told you that He would begin by crippling you in your arm or leg and removing you from all your usual sources of enjoyment, you would likely think it a very strange way of accomplishing the purpose to make you happy. Weird. Since it would appear this would achieve only unhappiness, but God's wisdom is manifold. And then the commentator gives this illustration. If you knew of a recluse who had gotten used to staying in a closed room where the curtains were drawn, enjoying the small electric lamps and the light they produced, and you wished to make this recluse truly happy, you might begin by turning out all his lamps, which might cause darkness for a time and irritate the recluse, and then open the curtains to let the full light in which would hurt his eyes. And so... His enjoyment, however, after would, would be even greater than the small enjoyment he had from the lamps. When God removes some of our apparent earthly comforts, which bring us joys, it's only to let in the greater light of his presence and jo greater joy. Give us greater joy. And even greater joy when we meet him face to face. When we suffer now but keep trusting God, it may appear to be a defeat and painful thing from the earthly perspective, but we can even have joy in the midst of it, knowing our suffering is being worked by God for our greater good. The famous Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him. I've been reading through a devotional called, called Voices from the Past. It's a uh, one-page Puritan extracts. And uh, one Puritan by the name of uh, Thomas Brooks said this in relation to what we've been talking about. The humble soul endeav endeavors more how to glorify God in affliction than how to get out of them. Daniel, the three children, the apostles, and those worthies of whom this world was not worthy were such. They were not seeking to get out of their afflictions, but were concerned for the glory of God. They were willing to be anything, bear anything, that God might be glorified. They made it their business to glorify God in the fire, the prison, the den, the rack, and under the sword. The humble soul says, Lord, keep down my sins and keep up my heart to honor you in all my troubles. Though my burdens are doubled and troubles multiplied, help me to honor you by trusting, waiting, and submitting to you, and I shall sing my cares away and say it's enough. Oh, but... When a proud man under troubles is full of plans to get off his chains and out of the furnace, the proud heart will say anything, will do anything, will be anything to free himself from the burdens that press him. 
So our main point is this. We become models for others and effective witnesses. We become models of faith for others and effective witnesses when we maintain joyous faith through trial. Let's pray. Lord, help us never to expect happiness from the world, but only in you. Let us not think we'll be more happy by living to and for ourselves in our own pleasure apart from you. Lord, we can only be happy if we are employed in service for you. And if we desire to live in this world, help us to do and accept what you allot for us. Teach us, Lord, that if we do not live a life that satisfies you, we will not live a life that satisfies ourselves. Oh, Lord, help us to live such a life, a life of joyous faith and trial, so that you may use our lives to impact others to come to faith. For your glory, Lord, we pray. Amen.